Um, I wanted to say a very warm welcome to everybody for Agency Tribe meeting number six. Today we have got Caesar Keller with us. A lot of people will know who Caesar Keller is because he's been a huge part of the Business Catalyst community and he has owned, started, um, created, grown and sold three Business Catalyst agencies, um, which I'm sure many people will know all about. So that's Tribe Beta, Simple Flame and Muse Grid. He's an incredible creative talent and his um, skills have been in both the creative and the strategic thinking monetization um, of a whole lot of agencies. Um, he's been both an entrepreneur and an intrapreneur. Um, following BC, he was also involved in Near Me, which a lot of people here know about, now um, Platform OS, as a Director of Product and Chief Creative. Hang on, what was it? Um, I can't read yeah, Chief Creative Officer. Chief Creative Officer, that's right. Then he went to a completely different industry right out of left field, which, which was really interesting. He was the Chief Operating Officer at REI Black Book. And now he's doing something else entirely. We're really, really lucky to have him. Um, he's going to be presenting um, to us on growth hacking, how to create a growth mindset to scale your agency. So thank you very much for taking the time to Present to us, Caesar. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate uh, both Barry and uh, Ursh for this opportunity. Happy to be here. And uh, I guess, shall I get started? Absolutely. All right. Let me get on here. All right, so just a little bit kind of behind the scenes for me, as Ursh mentioned, there's some brands and whatnot that uh, some of you might know me by, and those are the brands uh, based on the Business Catalyst stuff. I founded uh, Pixel IQ in uh, 2006, and uh, from then, uh, basically, that was the flagship agency, and all the brands that uh, we're known through from Business Catalyst, Simple Flame, Cayuga, Travita, uh, and Muse, uh, were basically offsets of that particular agency, so doing business as type of a thing. So I did that from 2006 to 2015, and then like Ursh said, from 2015 to 2019, I was uh, working with Anne Broadway, a great relationship there with uh, Platform OS, and then a software company here in St. Louis. So a little bit about my background, my education, uh, I went, got a business degree uh, with an emphasis in management information systems from St. Louis University. And uh, as far as uh, agencies that I sold before Pixel IQ, I had created Affiliate Interactive uh, actually while I was at the university, so young entrepreneur there, and then formed Keller and Hayes Consulting. And I was able to uh, have an exit strategy with a healthcare education company uh, called Assist Guide there. As far as roles that I've played uh, from an operational or executive perspective, you name it, I've kind of been there, done that because I've co-founded various agencies, uh, but uh, a lot of it also comes from the design and management roles. Uh, so whether it's been product designer, UX UI, creative director, you name it, I've kind of been there and done that in the last 20 years. So a lot of design stuff and a lot of operation stuff as far as I'm concerned. But for today's conversation, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, growth hacking. And I'm going to be sharing some insights and some things that I learned along the way, some failures, some successes, and hopefully get you guys to ask some good questions at the end. So here's the agenda that I wanted to cover today. Number one, obviously uh, a little review on what kind of growth hacking is. Um, there's a piece of it within a growth hacking called uh, the North Star. So we're gonna define what that concept is, share some examples of some big companies that use it. Then there's a certain meeting structure that you can have if you wanna have this approach within your agency. Uh, maybe small steps to get started. Uh, how do you start if you're a solo person? How do you start this if you're a group? Obviously sharing some life lessons and insights as I've kind of gone through uh, the different agencies that I've, that I've worked at uh, and, and started and, and kind of sold. And then lastly, open it up for some interactive Q&A. So looking forward to it, guys. 
All right, let's just kind of jump right in. So what is growth hacking? It can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, but if I break it down to its smallest context and its simple context is basically an ongoing focus so you can use strategy and tactics around scaling your business. Uh, it's the mindset, and you've heard this probably, right? It's an old cliche, working on the business rather than in it. Uh, too many times I've had conversations with a lot of people that are starting out, they want to start out their own agency, but what they end up doing is basically creating a job for themselves rather than a business. So uh, we'll uncover some of those particular conversations as we go through the presentation, okay? Next part, there's kind of a big difference. Uh, it's a small insight, but it's a big difference. And that is there's a difference between growing and scaling. So I wanted to just nip that in the butt really quickly so we can all have the same terminology kind of moving forward. Growth means that revenue and expenses grow at the same pace. So let's say you're getting some good work, you're starting your agency work, you're getting business, things are kind of moving forward, and you're like, man, this is just not enough. I need more revenue. But then it's like you got to hire more people to do more work. So revenue will go up, but expenses will go up. So it's like, well, how do I get out of that? Because what I need is more profit, not more revenue, okay? So there is a big difference between the top line, uh, which is the, the revenue line, versus the bottom line, which is your, exp your expenses line, right? So when you think about scaling, it's just a little tweak to that, right? It's how can you continue to grow the revenues, but keeping your bottom line down? Uh, another way to think about it is basically mitigating risk, right? So I kind of put three different examples there, kind of like a traffic light example. Let's say you make a million dollars this year, but you spent a million dollars to make the million dollars. Well, you might have a great practice and you're doing great things, but you're not being able to take anything out for yourself or to reinvest. You can make $1 million and spend 800,000, so you net $200,000, that's pretty good. What do you do with that money? And then the last one is I made a million dollars, but I was able to only have to spend 500 to get there. So as you can see, scaling has a totally different context than just growing. Uh, and if you start with this particular mindset and you start with this basic fundamental understanding those differences, it allows you to build multiples over time. So when you talk about an exit strategy, it's gonna pay off for you in the long run, okay? Uh, next thing, it's like, what are the priorities for scaling? Uh, there's a quote that I absolutely love from Peter Drucker, so I'll just kind of read it right out. There's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. It's like, why do you even focus on something that's not helping you, right? So if you break that kind of statement into like three simple parts, I always think about effectiveness, efficiency, and scaling. Effectiveness is just a simple question. Are we doing the right things? If you're doing the wrong things, you need to stop doing the wrong things, okay? And then once you decide, here's the final list. These are the things that we're doing, right? Well, are we doing them right? Meaning, can you actually do them better than you're doing them? And whatever it takes, uh, saving time, saving energy, being smarter, providing more value, the list can go on, but that's the efficiency side. And if you have those first two parts, it actually allows you to start thinking about the mindset of scaling. If you don't go through that energy and distinguishing those two first parts, sometimes it gets hard to just jump right into scaling. Does that make sense? And the last part is, can we do more of the, of the right things the right way? So requirements for growth hacking. Here are kind of like the pillars, uh, if you will, and then we'll dive into each one of them a little bit more. The first one is the mindset. The, this kind of comes with an attitude, right? And, and it always has to start from the top. This is, this is the way that this company thinks. This is how we're going to evolve. Everything has a root fundamental uh, based on we want to scale the business. If you don't have that mindset, it's just going to be very, very difficult. And it's an ongoing mindset. We'll jump into that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. The second is culture. Once you have the right mindset, the, the culture really defines it. And these are, you know, even if you're a solo entrepreneur, you have to make it very clear to your partners or your consultants or your contractors or even your clients, your customers. You have to make sure that the culture that you just admit is that of efficiency and doing the right thing and providing value and, and scaling your business because people have to believe in it. And this, this can't be a story that you put together. This is something that you have to live day in and day out. Uh, you've heard of systems, right? Everyone always talks about you gotta have systems in place. That's really no joke. 
Uh, but besides just being a cliche, we'll dive into some examples and practical insights about that a little bit later on. And the last one is discipline, right? The, in order to really run through all of it, it's just day in, day out. That's the hustle, the grind. You just have to have the discipline to just keep this mindset going, keep the culture going, and keep working on those systems. Okay, so the last one basically benefits all three. Well, let's dive in and let's talk about each one of these individually a little bit. So here's the main three points that I had about mindset. The first is you have to consider optimization and scaling at all times. Gone are the days where you don't care about it anymore. Like every day that you get up, you have to be like, how is the things that I'm doing today impacting the ability to optimize what I'm doing and to scale the things that I'm doing, okay? Um, you've also probably heard this, units of time for units of money. Man, I mean, you're never gonna grow a business. You're not gonna, never gonna be a successful business if all you do is trade units of time for units of money. There's gotta be other ways that you can leverage and create a diverse portfolio. Uh, if you are trading units of time for units of money, you're not really a business. You're a practice. Uh, the easiest example that I tend to talk about is let's say you're a successful lawyer firm, right? They're only as good as their latest client, is only as good as how many hours they're billing and the rate that they're billing at. But if their customers go away, they're not involved with you know any kind of law projects or whatnot, the money goes away. It's just a practice. So all you've done is created a job for yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that, but the way that you gotta think about scaling that, it's very difficult when it's all about units of time for units of money. And the last thing is you have to educate yourself. Um, you got to team up and you, get, you just have to start. It's just about starting the planning, starting to think about, starting how you can actually implement some of these things right away. Believe it or not, it's not too difficult to implement some of these strategies. It just takes a little bit of effort and then it kind of snowballs into something bigger. Okay. Um, as far as mindset, I'll equate it a lot to uh, maybe kind of like losing weight. I've been through the trials and tribulations of being a big guy and then having to lose weight. It's just kind of one of those lifestyle changes. And we'll talk about that as far as the discipline part as well. Culture. Culture is so important, guys. Um, a lot of the agencies that I talked to and kind of uh, talked uh, talk with when I was at Business Catalyst uh, or doing work with Business Catalyst, a lot of these uh, agencies were small, two, three, four people. But even if you're a small team, the culture has to all share the mindset. So if you are responsible or you're the leader, uh, you have to make sure that the rest of your team is on the same page and they share the passion for scaling. Um, you need to provide them education and explain the benefits very clearly uh, because if they don't believe or they don't understand, it could be very, very counterproductive. Some people don't care about scaling. They don't care about growth or they might have anxiety or pressures or fears for growing and scaling. Um, you know, I even experienced some of that in some of the agents that we had. Some of the people didn't understand what we were doing. So you have to make sure that that communication is a, a top bottom approach. Very, very important. All right, systems. So I just kind of put three questions here. Do you have documentation in place? Rarely do companies have enough documentation as far as what they're trying to do. Uh, do you use real data for better informed decisions? So many people just kind of wing it, and it's just a gut feel. Uh, but there's so many tools nowadays that you can use to have more, uh, better information, uh, data that's realistic and measurable uh, to make better uh, informed decisions. And lastly, have you implemented things like scorecards or evaluated your value chain? By value chain, I mean like the different parts and segments that you get from start to finish to acquire business. So maybe a sales is one, sales and marketing, the second is onboarding clients. The third one is actually doing the production work. And the last one might be the maintenance and then the finalization of the actual deal. Each one of those segments of your value chain, uh, do they have efficiency ratings? How do you, how you measure the success? If you go over on hours on a project, how, how do you deal with that? Uh, you know, these are, I'm talking about human systems as well as programmatic systems. Uh, all of them have to be working in, in, in place in order for you to scale. Um, and the more you pay attention to it, the easier it's going to be to kind of have a chance at scaling. Last one's discipline. You definitely got to stay committed. This is not one of those things that's just a sprint. You get to the end, you're done. This is an ever life ongoing change. 
Uh, have you established an accountability chart or an accountability log of who's responsible for making things happen? Uh, you know, do you measure the success and direct it towards long-term planning? And guys, this is just a never-ending thing until you have that exit strategy, you have the check and you're done and you're moving on. Uh, so it's definitely a marathon mentality. All right, let's talk about some growth, um, growth hacking core elements. These are just, just some core things that you kind of have to pay attention to as you're getting started. Uh, you're going to need a cross-functional team in order to kind of make this happen. And uh, a lot of the different smaller companies that I have worked with, I've noticed that a lot of their teams work in silos, meaning that they're all compartmentalized. But as far as the passing of the baton, which is a great analogy, right? You drop the baton, you lose. You, you come too fast, you can drop the baton. You come in too slow, not good enough. Everyone's got to have that communication in place at the right sequence. And having the, a cross-functional team that understands multiple departments, understands the value of scaling in the business, uh, it's, it's going to make a big difference. However, uh, having diverse backgrounds also helps. Now, the one thing I'll say here is some of you guys are, are solo, you know? But that doesn't mean that you don't have mentors, you don't have people that help you, you don't have partners, you don't have contractors. All these particular people can be considered your cross-functional team, but just make sure that uh, they have the fundamental understanding of what you're trying to accomplish besides just the services day in and day out. The second aspect is just data. Data, data, data. I can't say it enough. You just got to learn how data can be measured. Uh, there's a lot of things that we all do in the, we, we call it the whirlwind, right? There's the 40 to 50, 60 hour work weeks, the long weeks, there's a million things that we have to do. And we just kind of start the day and immediately get into that whirlwind. But are you actually measuring the things that actually matter? Do you have key performance indicators that are showing you that you're doing better or that you're doing worse or things that are stagnant? And if you don't have the discipline to call those things out, it can feel like you're just stuck in mud and not moving forward. And then the last aspect is growth hacking is not about this huge, long project or this huge thing that you have to do. It's about small, very small, smart experiments that you could quickly measure and kind of move forward with. Um, I think a lot of times people get scared once you start talking about some of these growth hacking topics and they think, wow, it's just too big of a burden, I'm too busy. And the reality is it doesn't have to be. It can be very simple and straightforward. Let's talk about who gets on your team. This growth hacking requires a team. Um, it starts with you, the growth lead, whoever's gonna implement this thing. Uh, but ultimately, uh, it's about the team that surrounds you and how you can share it. Now, this is what the typical team is made out of. Obviously, there's a team lead. Usually, that's an executive person that fundamentally either founded the business, started the business, has been the operational person for the business. Then there's people that come from the project product or project management uh, sphere of influence. There's developers, designers, people that actually work on your products and services. Uh, obviously, marketing people, they have a lot of experience with uh, understanding data, key performance, uh, what sells, what doesn't sell, how to present the offer in the right way, and then data analysts. So those are kind of like the, the key bubbles, if you will, like where these particular team people come from. I will say, though, breaking away from the traditional sense, uh, sometimes people in customer service or customer experience. Uh, sometimes people that are you know, on the ground selling, even uh, not the sales directors, but just regular salespeople, they kind of are in tune or they're at the front line of like, you know, what people need, what people don't, what people get excited about, what's not working, uh, what are all the problem areas. So uh, try to consider those people as well. Let's talk about a, a little bit about the process itself. The process is actually quite simple. Uh, there's four little segments to it, and uh, they're very similar to like a production or life cycle. Uh, but it's just about, you know, talking about these particular growth hacking topics. The first one is the analysis. The analysis is like, what are you going to do? What are the things that can actually move the needle for your company? And uh, sharing those ideas uh, and generating those ideas, right? So those kind of go and have a symbiotic uh, relationship. And it's not about how many ideas you can come up with. It's about the right ones. 
the next thing is prioritizing, right? You can get a list of a lot of different ideas, but ultimately it comes down to which ones you do first. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some pragmatic uh, insights as to how to prioritize and how this all works. And lastly, I did talk about like, uh, these are small experiments, right? You're gonna implement something quickly, you're gonna measure it, you're gonna get the results. If it's not working, you stop doing it. If you start seeing some progress and you measure it, you start seeing some success, how can you do more of that one thing? And then it's one of those rinse and repeat cycles. All right, I talked about our agenda, kind of talking about a North Star. So one of the things that's defined by growth hacking is kind of a, a focus, right? Um, it's one big key metric that you know, if you change that key metric and you start seeing that key metric perform better and better and better, it's gonna make a huge impact, not only for your business, but for your customers. So one way that you can kind of define that is what is the aha moment for your customer? When your customer or when your client goes, oh my God, this was an amazing experience. This is, this is like, there's so much value in working with this group. I, I, I just need more and more and more of it. Well, what is that? And how can you measure that? And when you measure that and it has impact in your business, how can you create an entire plan of a whole bunch of experiments that change that metric? Now, what it does is once you define that metric, it's going to give you that focus so you can have some triage mechanism as far as continuing to come up with all these experiments. So it helps reorient uh, all your growth efforts uh, for optimal solutions, which is kind of nice. Now, the thing is, you can change your North Star. Uh, obviously, you know, businesses evolve, your company evolves, your offerings evolve. Uh, you can pivot as far as your company. So just because you pick a North Star today doesn't mean it has to be the North Star for up, okay? And that's a key important thing because we're always looking for the best results possible. So here's some examples of some big names that you might have heard in the industry, some big players, and uh, they all have uh, North Stars that they're using for growth hacking. So for Airbnb, it's number of nights booked um, this is, is an example that came out of a book, um, you know, Hacking Growth. I'll share that information with you guys later on. But for them, it's, you know, the, the script that I kind of pulled out is it didn't matter what the team did from email subscribers to registrations. If it didn't move the number and move the needle when it comes to how many bookings there were at the end of the month, they didn't care. Okay. How, and that's all they focused on is at the end of the 30 days of this month, how many bookings occurred? Was it good? Was it bad? Was it different? What happened? What did we do? What's working? Okay, let's try again next month. How can we get more bookings? Okay. Uh, in fact, one of the examples and one of the case studies that they have, which is actually pretty cool, is uh, they had uh, cities like uh, Chicago and New York and LA, and they did a study on the quality of the photos that they put for the actual listing had a correct, a direct effect into how many bookings that particular place had. So if someone kind of showed up with a crappy cell phone, crappy photos, the lighting wasn't good and like people didn't care, the chances of that place being booked was way smaller than somebody who like has a nice camera, lit the place correctly, clean place, took really nice shots, way better chances of having the place booked because everything comes in through the eyes, it's first impressions that count and matter. So they started experimenting with providing services in those areas to basically do professional shoots at a low quality price so that bookings would go up. Make sense? Next example is eBay. Number of items sold. It's pretty basic, right? The more items that are being sold means that more people have experienced the, I got what I wanted, I got it at a fair price, I was able to win something. The, the product ended up with me and it was like directly as, as prescribed, you know, like they said it was in mint condition, I got it in mint condition, this is great. I'd rather have this experience, I was happy about it, I'm gonna shop again. And again and again and again on eBay because I have a little bit more skin in the game. I have less, uh, you know, concerns that I had a bad experience. The number of items sold in the beginning was, was, was everything for them. And obviously now it's just, it's just crazy how big eBay has gotten. WhatsApp, for them, it's number of messages sent. 
obviously they're kind of circumnavigating the space of communications uh, at lower prices, especially when people live in different countries and you don't want to pay those long, you know, long connection fees and whatnot. How many communications were successful? How many messages have gone back and forth between people talking to their loved ones, their family, their friends, uh, negotiations, whatever it meant, but how many of those uh, successful messages got sent, okay? Facebook. Facebook has obviously evolved. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in, in that now it's daily active users. But in the beginning, remember I told you the, the, the concept of North Star can change. When they first kind of started in, in the early years, it was all about monthly active users. How many people would use our app monthly within, within a cycle of 30 days? Well, now they got it down to, I don't know, maybe they get it down to hours. So many people are always on Facebook all day long. They have a lot of data to support how many daily active users are using the system, what they're doing, what, what their favorite stuff is, okay? Now, I just gave you some examples of some pretty big, you know, pretty big companies, but the, con you know, the concept stays true. The concept of the North Star is, is pretty basic and pretty simple. And I'll, I'll talk about some other insights and other kind of ways that you can think about a North Star. But the one thing that I wanted to, to quickly jump on is there should really be no excuses, right? We can all think about something that just makes sense. And uh, the biggest excuses that I hear always are, I don't know about this growth hacking stuff. I can't do it. I don't have the time. You know, I don't have the time to learn. I don't have the time to implement it. I don't have the right team in place. I don't even have products either. How would you even do this? Well, you can definitely adjust this and you can do it for service models as, as well. As far as education, there's books that are written on it. There's videos, there's blogs. I have a whole bunch of resources that I'll be glad to share with you guys. Um, you guys might even be doing some of this growth hacking stuff and you, you're just not aware that that's what it was. Um, but there's definitely a lot of materials out there that are cheap to get and it just takes, takes an attitude and mindset for you to care about it. As far as time, if, you're not, if you truly want a business and not a practice, and you want to get away from trading units of time for units of money, understanding these concepts, measuring these concepts, and doing this for real is going to have a tremendous impact on what you're doing for the business. I can guarantee it. If you're a solo person and you don't have a team, that's really not an excuse because we all work with different people. You know, we can't do it alone. And again, it doesn't have to be an official partnership. It doesn't have to be employees. It could be friends that you know that are in the space. There's so many people that were starting out with the business catalyst that uh, Jason and I, as we were growing Simple Flame, we, we made a whole bunch of friends and they started solo and they grew to have successful agencies. And we always shared insights with them. They shared insights with us. Uh, even though it was an official partnership, you can definitely learn and you can partner with uh, good professionals and colleagues. Um, if you don't have a product, you know what? A lot of these tactics and a lot of the things that I'm going to share with you as far as insights, these things can be, um, you know, systematically adjusted, I guess, for services. You don't necessarily have to have a product. Although we're going to dive in and talk about some digital product stuff. Uh, that's, that's one way to kind of dip your toe into those waters and still have a product, even though it's not necessarily a big application or anything like that. So no excuses, guys. All right, so once you start the growth hacking process, typically the people that do this are doing it, their cycle is once a week to kind of just check in. I've seen cycles out as far as, you know, every two weeks and whatnot, but the, the thing is about speed. Uh, so this is why a lot of teams are doing it weekly. Um, the high level or macro level agenda kind of has four parts, and these four parts are assuming that you've kind of started it, right? That's why I highlighted the first one. The, the first one is go over experience. You're not going to go over experiments or anything the first time you go through this, so kind of ignore that for the first one. But the second part is triaging the initiative. You're going to get a list of initiatives. You're like, man, it would be great to have all these little experiments, and then from there, you got to triage them. Which ones are you going to green light? Which ones are you going to put on the back burner? Uh, which ones are the ones that have the most impact? So those two make sense. And then obviously measure, measuring on a week-to-week -week basis, what's working, what's not working. And then like I said, it's just kind of a rinse and repeat mechanism. You basically go over what were the things that we tried, this is where they're at, uh, this is the success that they're having, okay, as we wrap those up, what are the next ones we can do, so on and so forth. So pretty simple, high-level agenda. 
But let's dive in a little bit deeper to find out what this kind of looks like when you start organizing it. So what, what drives the meeting is kind of a simple spreadsheet layout. And um, the way that, you know, there's different ways to do it. This is the way that I know I've done it. We did it with uh, uh, my latest company and whatnot that, that I was a COO for. And number one is just a list of projects. What are the list of initiatives that you want? And you create a hypothesis, right? If this, then that. If I do this, my experience or my gut tells me that the result of this is going to be as follows, this, this, and this, okay? So you start setting your experiments up. And then uh, if you have a group or team of people, obviously you're logging who is reporting all these. And then you really start getting into scoring or the triage, right? So these are, you can do more, but these are the simple ways of how to triage. Number one is how many departments are needed? Okay, if it takes every single department in your organization to move this through, and if you're just a one solo person, does it take marketing? Does it take sales? Does it take development? Does it take R&D? Does it take like all these pieces? Or does it just take this one piece? Obviously, the more departments that are required, it starts leading into more complexity, more time, more energy, so on and so forth. Then there's three scores. Okay, this is what we call the ice score. Number one, how much impact do you think the hypothesis will have if the performance holds true? Do you think it's going to have low impact, medium impact, high impact? The higher the impact, the more of a score you get, right? Five out of five would be this is, is the best impact that we can possibly have. Confidence. We all have different experiences. We all have a different sphere or background of where we come from. So when you do share the ideas with your team, Kind of do a team score. What do we think the confidence is going to be that this thing is going to be successful and it's actually going to impact that North Star? If we feel it's going to have low impact, that's fine. If we feel it's going to have high impact on that confidence, then you got to rate that a little bit better. And then the ease. The ease is a weird one, just to let you know. The simpler the item is, so the more ease, the higher the score. The harder it gets, the lower the score. And that's what gives you your ice score. So at the end of the day, when you have all your initiatives, you have all these ice scores on the right-hand side. It doesn't mean that you're just going to take the highest, although that, that's, that's the most common sense, right? But it just gives you a good objective kind of measuring tool to go, what do we think we need to do now? How do we organize these into chunks of experiments that make sense for all of us? And then ultimately, you assign an owner. Who's going to own that? So if you have, let's say, three or four people in your organization, can you give each one of them one experiment that they're going to run that they can come back with and report back? So divide and conquer as best as you can. On some of the complicated ones, obviously you might need to collaborate all together on those. All right, so here's kind of where I'm going to share some insights. Um, some of these, again, I was doing before I learned about growth hacking or whatnot, but just kind of sharing some of these ideologies of how to go from a single person growing your agency, getting more business, and being smart with what you do. Okay. So Keller Hayes Consulting was my second agency. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to share as far as just being diligent on was sales tracking queue. Uh, today, we kind of know this more like a sales pipeline. But I really got involved with creating ratios and numbers and understanding what I had to do to drive sales. Um, so just a quick example, right? If you need to close $10,000 worth of business per month and your closing ratio on most occasions is 40%, four out of 10 people, you would need 25,000 plus in the queue every single month to even have a shot at generating $10,000. If you don't have that much in the queue, it doesn't matter though. I guess the only way you could do it is if your closing ratio was like 100% or you're always closing more than you ever have. So there, there's kind of the math and the formula, right? But the math and the formula is pretty simple. It's pretty simple math. But the time and dedication that it took for me to build a proper sales pipeline, that, like to truly understand my closing ratio, to truly understand what it took, that's kind of what the operational or the documentation or, you know, the ability to consistently generate the funds that I wanted to kind of get to that next level. Uh, the second bullet point that you see there is note the plus. So there's two things about the 25,000 plus. The first thing is, as you start getting opportunities in your queue, 
as you start closing some of your opportunities, depending on whether they're high value, mid value, or low value, you got to understand how that affects the queue that you have left. Because if you close a big project, but let's say it's like 6K, and the rest of your other things in the queue are like $500, $1,000, $1,500, you're going to have to close a lot of those to get to your 10K. So understanding like how you're breaking your opportunities in chunks really is something that you got to plan out. It can't just be organic and kind of shoot from the hip. Uh, the second thing is having more than the proper ratio. Because just because you generally close 40% worth of business doesn't mean you're going to close 40% this month and next month and the following month. That's just a guideline. So what can you do to get that queue as high as you possibly can and get it high consistently all the time? Uh, so the last bullet point is, you know, so your key consists of what? What are you doing to build that key? And what are specific things that you can measure? So how many calls are you making? How many emails are you sending out? How many texts are you sending out? How many networking events are you going to? Marketing blast, direct email, referrals. Guys, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you've been an agency owner and you're in sales and you gotta drive the business, you know what this is like. But this is where things like EOS uh, or, or pragmatic systems, like having a scorecard and understanding like, there are numbers that you can basically focus on as far as I have to do these responsibilities, get these accomplished, and if I don't get them done, it's going to hurt my sales queue. I was doing all this kind of stuff before I knew about EOS. I was doing this before, you know, really studying what pipelines are because it was just sheer determination and passion of we have to close this much business every single month to grow. So being dedicated for it and kind of moving forward. So tracking your sales queue is a huge, huge thing. Uh, there's a lot of software out there now that can help you with this. I was doing simple spreadsheets back in the day. Uh, a tool that I like real, uh, right now that's very, very easy is Pipedrive. So check out pipedrive.com if you like that particular tool. And I can share some others uh, with you guys in a later moment. Here's another example of things that I was doing with the second agency, maintenance service bundles. Um, generally, obviously, when you're selling web development or digital kind of design or development work, you're getting into this like project mentality, right? Here's a project, this project's whatever, $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, get the project done, we're done. And then you never do anything else for that client. Well, if you're doing that, you're hurting yourself. You're shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, you got to somehow deal with the understanding that getting and acquiring new clients is harder than preserving the ones that you already have. So if you have closed business and you have completed a successful project, what kind of bundling or service or maintenance or retainer can you have for that customer and give them value? Because if the only value you have is completing the project, you're leaving a lot on the table, okay? This is where if you're not doing this, you can't increase your monthly recurring revenue. If you're not doing this, you're probably not having open sales cycle conversations, meaning if you're not in front of your customers in a more frequent basis, how are they going to give you referrals? How are they going to give you more business? How are you going to attend to their needs if you just finish a project and then you contact them three or four, five, six months later? Doing this and creating these bundles gives you an opportunity to A, why don't you lower the percentage or lower the price of the work as an incentive, but you have better cycles, you open communications, uh, give them some incentives and values. One of the biggest things if you keep these cycles of communication with your customers open and you're giving them value time in and time out, you're going to get more referrals because they're always thinking about you. They're always thinking about how you're helping them. Such a small, simple thing. But a lot of the business that I generated in that sales pipeline that I talked about before was referral based back in the days with Kellen Hayes Consulting. All right, jumping into Pixel IQ. The first year that we did Pixel IQ, it was uh, pretty successful the first year. I mean, it was a matter of months before we were operating in a black, which was a blessing. However, we were taking all kinds of custom projects left and right. And kind of, I'll say towards the end of the year when we're like, okay, we're going to reinvest. How are we going to grow? What are we going to do to get to that next level? We kind of had a hindsight and we started going back. I'm like, man, how do we build this project? It was that technology. It was that software. Man, if we hire more people and we hire more talent to design and develop projects, who are we going to hire? Because 
we've used like six different technologies, three different platforms, two different things over here. Our customers are demanding more and more. Man, this is just not going to scale. We're, we're just going to grow, but we're, all we're doing is going to be adding more risk. So we immediately started doing research. Uh, I believe if the story serves me right, Jason Timmy found a, a TechCrunch article is how we got in touch and found out about Business Catalyst. Obviously, we reviewed other systems and platforms at the time. We kind of fell in love with the five-in-one system. We wanted to leverage that as far as our marketing and sales opportunity. And we did find out that a lot of the custom development that we were used to, we could actually use uh, Business Catalyst as more of like an exoskeleton or framework type of a thing, but build a lot of custom things inside of it, but do it way more in a, in a procedure format. Kind of like, this is how we do it, time in, time out. Uh, get a lot of value, but the consistency is what we wanted. Um, now, we didn't know if it was going to be a success or not, and we didn't want to hurt the Pixel IQ brand. So for the first couple of months, we decided, hey, we're going to rebrand this as a brand new agency, and we're going to leverage this whole mentality and approach on how to build projects. And uh, if it works out, we'll keep the name, and slowly but surely, we'll, we'll reserve Pixel IQ for other things and we'll start the new brand. So that's how Simple Flame was actually born. So development and frameworks, picking the technologies that you use. Um, very, very important stuff. All right, digital products. Uh, obviously, Cayuco, Tribita, MuseGrid, these are some examples of the uh, particular digital products that we are creating. Um, we wanted to stop trading units of time for units of money. So we had lots and lots of conversations behind the scenes on how we were going to do that. Um, I'll tell you the story about Cayuco. Cayuco was one of those, hey, you know what? Let's, uh, we're really good at what we do. We're really good at optimizing and doing custom things. Our team is learning a lot of tips and tricks and power, power steps on how to do things in a systematic approach. Why don't we share some of that with other business catalyst partners? A, it's going to position us as uh, authority uh, in this particular sphere of uh, business catalyst. Uh, number two, we understand that we use these things day in and day out. It's going to become like a digital cheat sheet, and uh, we're going to get exposed and create a lot of relationships with a lot of BC partners that are going to be asking us questions. Uh, so it's a win-win right off the bat. We didn't know how much success it was going to have. But uh, the good faith was there, and most importantly, we, we defined that the value was going to be there. And what turned out to be a marketing uh, kind of initial concept turned into a business. Um, it, was, it was kind of cool to see the ticket, right? Whenever you start this whole, it's kind of like having an e-commerce product, or you, know, you just sit there and like, day one, we released. How many people are signing up? Zero. Okay. After 30 days, we had so many people sign up. After six months, so many just kept on growing and growing. But what we, what we wanted was, A, to position ourselves and kind of provide value, but we wanted the monthly recurring revenue, right? We wanted something besides projects to kind of leak in, and it's another little faucet of, of recurring revenue. Uh, it was pretty neat, kind of when we got to like $10,000 a month, we we're like, wow, that's $120,000 a year for something that's not taking us too many hours to maintain over the month and is providing a lot of good faith and uh, you know positivity in this particular community. So it was pretty cool. Well, when we got done with uh, Cayuco, we're like, what else can we do? Well, obviously templates uh, is something that uh, maybe some of you are familiar with. Some of you guys might have even bought some of our templates. Uh, but uh, again, a template is just a template. How did we deliver the value? Well, based on how we learn how to put together websites, obviously you can put together a website with different technology, a hundred different ways. We found a way that made sense for us. Uh, we found a way to, to make things easier to maintain, uh, consistency, so as you have many, many clients, how you start maintaining many, many clients matters. But if everything is built consistently from project to project to project, it optimizes time. And the other thing is we provided context of the templates, meaning we really sat down as a business team and said, if we were to design a restaurant website, what are the things that would be important to a restaurant owner? And we really tried to deliver that value across every single theme that we created. Um, and then lastly, once we did uh, the templates for Business Callus and we had some success there, a lot of the hard work was already engineered and designed. 
we're like, why can't we just reinvent this wheel and leverage and repurpose, just like you've heard of repurposing content for SEO, we repurposed our product for a, a very similar product in the space, which was Adobe News. So anyway, it doesn't have to be a systematic, this is huge application that you have to build. Sometimes these ideas can just come in the format of a marketing concept or training concept or something like that. Uh, so don't be scared of thinking through digital product ideas. You'd be surprised what you can come up with. Simple plan. Let's talk about some agency. One of the things that I learned is as you get better and better at selling, why not try to sell something that's one to many as far as relationship uh, building and like you sell one deal, but you get five deals in return. To be honest with you, the effort is maybe a little bit more, uh, but the winnings that you can get from it are, are twofold. Um, number one is you get the business, but number two, you get much more repeated business and you get quantity out of it, which is kind of cool. So examples of this, we sold um, some deals to some franchises. So one like JC Grayson, I believe, was a financial institution. They're opening up satellite offices. So we started the contracts by saying, yes, we're going to build the first one. But as multiple offices start opening up, they're going to need the same kind of theme and design and branding, but they're going to have contextual content for those particular local areas. So we kind of sealed the deal ahead of time. And with one sale, we were able to, I believe, close like four or five uh, different deals to start with. Another franchise that we work with was uh, MLware. And uh, they were a screen printing company doing apparel and putting logos and stuff on, on apparel. And uh, very similar mentality. You know, we created kind of like a little pricing schedule to help different people in the particular franchise. We became ghost developers uh, for uh, other BC partners. That was something else that was pretty cool. Uh, because of Kayuko, because of the templates, we formed really good relations with the people, which was kind of nice. Um, and ultimately, the design, some of them were great at design and bad at development, and uh, the vice versa. So we would step in and help them wherever they needed. But anyway, seek out partnerships, find experts out there, close deals that have much more long-term in mind. Uh, and by closing one deal, you effectively close multiple. So keep that in mind with your sales strategy. You might find out that that can help with your revenue streams as well. That helped us out a lot. All right, getting into kind of platform OS and near me. As director of product, one of the things that we were doing there is as we were building a whole bunch of cool custom projects, it wasn't necessarily about what's the most that we can bill out for a project. It was a how can we partner with the people that are interested in building some marketplaces and the things that they're asking for are those custom things that rather than just building custom, can we somehow engineer and design those requests into a framework that's going to help everyone moving forward, meaning future customers, future developers, future designers that are using this platform, they're going to be able to take advantage of these modules, this framework, and build faster and design better on it. Uh, some of the things that came out of that uh, you know, were kind of, GraphQL for front-end developers, uh, advancements to payment gateway configurations and options. Uh, you know, we had a, a community aspect of the marketplace uh, that had a very complicated stuff like activity fees. A lot of these things were kind of R&D, but it was a win-win-win. Win for the current client that we were working on, win for us as far as the platform is concerned, and obviously delayed gratification for wins for people that were going to consume these uh, products and services in the future. So um, having a flexible uh, marketplace uh, to be able to take advantage of all this stuff was pretty, pretty neat. Um, in, fact, in fact, one of the big things that we kept on battling was the onboarding process. Marketplaces require teams of people to onboard, to get registered, list their product, list their service, or just you know, start finding stuff as far as what, what you need as far as the product or service. So we, we knew that there was a lot of things that we had to work on on making a better onboarding process for our marketplaces. And that those technologies eventually ended up you know, helping everybody out. So if you do have a product, if you do have a service, try to think about how it can be leveraged for future generations of users. Uh, it's it's going to have tremendous impact on, on what you're doing. All right. So now what? Uh, let's talk about some things about how to get started, right? How do you get this, get this going based on some of the information that I covered today? Uh, well, number one, if you're solo, it's a choice and it's a mindset. 
We already covered that there's no excuses. In fact, uh, in some regards, I think it's easier for you to start some of this kind of stuff. But if you have a large team or a team and you got to be the change engine and you got to kind of push, hey, we need to start doing some of this, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how you can help your team kind of get into the right mindset. One of the things about research that I've done when I'm getting involved in operation and managing teams or whatnot is kind of understanding what causes fear, what causes resentment, what causes the, I, I fear the change, you know? Well, confusion, anxiety, resistance, frustration, false starts, these are all things that teams kind of hate, right? So uh, I found this really, really awesome article. It's a study from Dr. Lippitt. And I have the link there and I can give you guys more resources if you contact me afterwards. But ultimately you need vision, skills, incentives, resources, and an action play, plan to actually drive change. If one of those items is missing, it's gonna cause issues. So when you go into planning and you go into talking to your partners and your teammates, or even just yourself, because you might have these fears yourself, right? You gotta make sure that all these bases are covered. Uh, so document in terms of what is the vision? Well, what are we trying to accomplish? Document that. What are the skills needed to do this? Some of these skills I don't have. Okay, that means I need to partner with people that have these particular skills. What are the incentives? I mean, your team has to be incentivized to be able to want to go through a change. Uh, creatures of habit hate change. So what incentive are you going to give me? Uh, what are the resources that you're going to provide to make sure that this actually gets done? And what's the action plan? All of these things put together is what actually causes the change. So really good uh, way to think about if you're new to this, but you want to pursue this and you want to convince your team to kind of follow you, uh, read this article, uh, you know, get to this link and think about how you can actually make change through those, through those elements all being covered. All right, well, that's about it. That's what I have for today. Uh, what I wanted to share with you before I'm done is if you reach out to me uh, at Caesar at CaesarKeller.com, I'll gladly give you a copy of this presentation. I'll give you the spreadsheet template as far as the growth hacking uh, meetings. I also found an awesome PDF uh, that has a whole bunch of information on how to scale from a freelancer to an agency owner or going from solo to a team. Uh, it's got great information there. Uh, I, you know, I've done research, obviously preparing for today and previous research to actually do some of this growth hacking myself. So I have a list of a whole bunch of links and obviously some good books that I've read on the topic. So if you guys want to dive into a little bit more on the ed education, all you have to do is email me uh, and I will gladly email you back all that information to help you guys out on your journey. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much, Caesar. Um, we well, I feel like we've been the recipient of this incredible download of this wisdom that you um, had over the years that we've just been privy to. Um, um, Barry has put in a um, a chat um, place where you can put in any questions that you've got, or you can grab the microphone and. Um, I'll see if anyone else has got any questions. I've got some of my own, but I won't be greedy. I'll let other people start. So please pop in your questions while we have Caesar. All right. Are you guys moderating and you just ask me a question or do you want me to be the chat? Whatever you guys want to do. That's okay. We'll read out the questions for you. Um, okay. Very nice. So I've got, I've got, I'll start with my question um, because I was trying to, with your North Star, when you were talking about the North Star, if you, how do you determine what your North Star is if you've got a real diverse range of products or services or should you just pick something as a North Star to help you determine which product or service you should be focusing on? That's a challenge um, because when you have a lot of things going on, there's a lot of just moving pieces, right? Uh, what I would say is you can look at it from two sides, two different angles. The first angle that I tend to look at is overall as a business. If you aggregate all the things that you are doing, what are you trying to accomplish by scaling? Is it just more money? Is it more money based on a certain type 
of product or service line? Is it, uh, I want to pivot from this kind of business to this kind of business, meaning I know some people that started out as designers, but then they became developers. So they're like, you know what, I don't want to take any more design work. I want to weed myself out of that, and I want to do more development work. Or I used to do development and design, and now I'm more of a marketing strategy person. I know more about SEO. I know more about content, so I want to weed myself out of that. So it almost kind of starts with where are you heading in the long term and then breaking down kind of the steps. And maybe your North Star should be based on that broken down set of steps. The other way to look at it is you might have, let's say if you're doing five things, one of your things is extremely successful. And maybe when I talked about those three things about, you know, uh, there's, there's the effectiveness, there's the efficiency, well, that's the right thing that you're doing. What if you're just doing all the other stuff because you were trying to do it, but what if you stopped doing all that stuff and you just focused on that one thing? Could you grow that thing to be 10 times more than all the other four things that you're doing? So could you pick a North Star for that one thing that A, really makes you happy, or the one thing that you're really, really successful at, and put less pressure on the other stuff and like, well, I took that because I just needed revenue, but I don't really love it. I'm not passionate about it. So those are two angles to kind of help you with that. But uh, you and I can have way more conversations. I know we kind of started conversations before this presentation. Happy to give you more insights based on that. Hopefully those two things help. Yes, that's brilliant. I mean, there was so much material there that um, I, for one, will definitely be going through each of those slides and making loads and loads of notes um, because that you, you kind of took it from a whole range of different angles. In fact, this community, when you were talking about Pixel IQ and why you chose Business Catalyst because it sort of melded a whole lot of other disparate things and you were able to deliver on projects across a range of needs, I think that's one of the reasons why the XBC community at the moment is struggling so much because we all then did the same and now that's all gone. So it's so difficult to find something that provides that cohesive service. It kind of, the way you explained that explained really why it's been such a difficult year. Yeah, you know, if I had to do it all over again, and I've been kind of thinking, like, what would I do if I had to start all over again? Uh, and I'm not saying I have the answer, by the way. I'm just thinking of diversification, right, or, or risk management. Um, when we did websites, there was always, like, different levels, right? I'll call I don't know. I'll just throw this, these numbers out just to give you context. There's a $5,000 website. There's maybe a $15,000 website. And there's a $50,000 website. You know, we were kind of putting a lot of effort in, like, can we find one system that can handle all of those? And Simple Flame was successful at doing that. I mean, we were doing some pretty big website integrations on Simple Flame with Business Catalyst. But today, I'm like, if I had to do it all over again, why wouldn't I maybe pick three different systems for each level? And the system is, like, perfectly good to go for the level of service that you need. And by doing that, you've diversified your portfolio with three different systems. So case in matter, for low-end websites, it's something super easy. Could you use like something like Squarespace? You know, it's a very limited CMS. It's super easy to use templates. Super, I mean, you don't even need to code. You just drag, drop, use templates, drop things in. As long as you're selling the right marketing service, the right SEO service, the right, you know, let me help you with your content, putting together the website, that could be like, up to $5,000 deals, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, if you do something in the middle, could you use something maybe more like Webflow or Shopify or something like that? It's got a little bit more robust. It's got a little bit more tech. You can have a lot more customization. You can throw some tech at it, some development at it. But again, it's not like a grandiose system. So that's your mid-level. And then for your big daddy of them all, let's give a shout out to Platform OS. I know there's other systems out there, but that's a really robust system. Uh, you know, the hosting is a little bit more involved. The setup's a little bit more involved, although they're trying to make it a lot easier for us. Maybe that's where you put your big projects. And if one of those systems goes bye-bye, it's not your whole world. Mm. It's just a third of your world. So, that's right. So we've kind of... Again, I'm not saying that's a solution, but that's kind of where my head is at right now, just to share, like, if I had to do it, I'd be thinking like that, maybe, and yeah. just trying to diversify so all my eggs are not in one basket. Yeah. Or just picking perhaps one lot of clients that fit assist. I don't know. But 
yeah, it's, it's interesting. We're, and we're all having to do and learn all of those things all at once. So in terms of our systems and processes, whereas we might have had just one before, we've got a whole lot of different ones because they're all different um, and some are just emerging. So, yes, it's, it has been quite a challenge, but I'm talking too much. <laughs> I'll stop. Um, has anyone got any other comments or feedback or I do. questions? I have some questions. Um, <clears throat> Caesar, you had talked about experiments and I'm, can you give us some examples as experience experiments doing like advertising or direct mail or whatever, or is it something else? It's just really anything that you can come up with, but it has to be measurable that has an impact to your North Star. So I'll give you an example. Uh, for REI Black Book, where we were, uh, the North Star that we picked was churn. Uh, and it's just basically retention, right? We have a SaaS product. We have so many clients, or I'm sorry, customers that, you know, get signed on to our product. But the churn is they use it for so much and then they sign off and they stop using it, right? So how can we keep the customers more engaged, stay on longer, because what, what happens is they're on longer, they're paying you longer, and there's a compounding effect of how much money you earn based on how many more customers you're getting on there. So examples of how we were trying to improve retention. Um, one example is uh, creating an annual subscription. Because right now, one of the things that we were doing was we, you know, customers were paying month to month. But if they're paying month to month, and they're like, you know what, I'm really not using this, or whatever came up, I want to save some money, I'm just going to drop this out. Well, there was an average lifespan that we knew with metrics of what a month to month person was paying. But what if you gave them a discount, okay, let's say the discount was 20% or something like that, and they prepay you for an entire year, we created a campaign, we did annual subscriptions, so many people signed up. That did a couple of things. The hypothesis was, number one, our cash flow, we're going to have a nice little pop of cash because a lot of people are paying you up front for the service. Granted, you're giving them a little bit discount, but you're feeling that cash flow right now, so that's a positive gain. And number two, the chances of them just like completely leaving the software in X amount of months is negated because they've already prepaid for a whole year. So now you have a customer that's in this system for a whole year. So that's an example. Uh, another example would be uh, whenever people would get onboarded, we have an onboarding process for our SaaS product, right? Uh, we took a look at like, you know what? How can we improve that onboarding process? How can we make the advantages and how can we make learning the system faster? How can we get them to their quickest wins within the software? Like, in, like the real estate software is how quickly can we get you to your first deal done in real estate? Okay, so that's a huge win. But there's multiple steps to get to that win such as you got to set up your website, you got to set up email, you probably got to do a campaign because this, this tool of ours had marketing capabilities. Can you get an email blast going? Can you get people into your CRM to start marketing to? We, we kind of drew up a little plan. It's like, here's all the mini steps that lead up to the successful aha moment. How can we make onboarding better so they can get all those quick wins faster? So that was another little experiment that we run. So again, our North Star was we want to improve retention. We want churn to go down. Let's come up with 100 experiments that we can go, you know what, if we did this, customer satisfaction goes up. They stay on the platform just a little bit longer. They pay us for a couple more months, and we just kept on testing and testing and testing. Does that give you some good examples? Oh, absolutely. Um, I do have a couple more uh, and a comment, actually. And I, I like where you were you're going with two, three to four systems, you know, because – a lot of us got burnt with business calls. I know not everybody here tonight or watch will watch this and even knows about business calls or has used it. Um, so they're in WordPress and things like that. WordPress is a little different because it can go to different hosting, but it, there's nothing to say that WordPress might stop, stop developing it someday and just stop improving it or whatever they're doing. So people still need to think about that. Um, so the other question I had is more of a question or for you to explain, um, just give a high level overview. And this might be something we bring it back to talk about, but you mentioned EOS. I know what that is. I use it. And so there's a couple other people here. I know that use EOS, but if you can give a over high level overview of that. So people, if people are here that don't know what EOS is, they can understand what you were talking about. Sure, sure. Uh, so EOS stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. There's a book called Traction by Gina Wickman. Um, 
So if you want to get that resource, in fact, I can add that to the, to the list if you want to know more about that, then I can send you the email. But it's basically, there you go. There you go. So that has the whole explanation of what EOS is. But uh, here's the sphere or the highlights, right? Number one, you got to understand the data. You just, you have to be data centric, okay? Because without understanding your numbers as a company, you're never going to gain traction. The other process is people, uh, or, or part of the, this process is people. You got to really understand core values. You got to, it's kind of like the, uh, the good to great, I believe, the analogy that they had is you got to have the right people in the bus. And then not only that, you got to have the right people in the right seats type of a thing. So caring about the culture, the core values, and what you are all about as far as company. Uh, there's uh, systematic procedures uh, for accountability, meaning there's accountability charts, like who's accountable for certain things. So it's not just an org chart. It's the who is responsible for the things that have to happen in order for us to carry out the operations, the strategy, the success. There's a lot of uh, planning uh, type uh, of uh, systems in there. Uh, they call it a VTO organizer. It's like a vision uh, tracking organizing system. So there's annual plans, there's quarterly planning. Um, there's the, the 10 year where you'd like to be, the three year projections. I mean, it just, they put you through these exercises of really defining what in the world you're trying to accomplish without just kind of just winging it from day to day. Um, not only that, the, but besides the planning aspect, they break down like, okay, if you want to get there one year from now, how do you do that? Well, what are the things that are the most important things that you have to do in first quarter, second quarter, third quarter? So they use a terminology with rocks, like what are my rocks going to do? Those are basically the initiatives that you're doing that are the most important that everyone rallies around. And uh, to be honest with you, to some degree, if you're doing your rocks, it's very similar to growth hacking but those can be like major initiatives. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to roll out this product. I'm going to introduce this brand new service. I have to hire these people and start this new department. I mean, some of those things are just growth, not necessarily scaling, but it helps organize. So I'd highly recommend it. If you're a small business owner, it kind of gives you an operating system, you know, pun intended. Uh, so you're just not winging it yourself and it gives you some structure. Um, there's a lot more to it, but hopefully I gave it justice, Barry. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I do my quarterly VTOs, and, you know, I only started last year. Uh, well, 2017. Didn't do it the whole year, but the what I'm getting at is I looked at my quarterly numbers. I tried to – you put a number out there that you want to hit for that quarter, and I was putting pressure on myself to do that. In the past, I said, oh, we're paying the bills. We made this much this year and that's the only thing I looked at, you know, so it, it gets you to look at it. How did you get to those numbers? So, but anyways, this isn't about EOS. I just wanted to have you explain that. Um, I don't see any other questions. Uh, I didn't know if anybody else wanted to turn the mic on. If you have any questions, that'd be awesome. Um, we're here. We got probably, if people want to hang out and ask questions, Caesar, we got another 20 minutes. Yeah, I'm here as long as you need me. So happy to chat. Caesar, did you have any aha moments as you were putting the presentation together? Uh, I haven't designed in a while, so I kind of like designing my own presentation. I was like, yeah. oh, back to my roots and making things pretty and spacing. It's definitely uh, pretty. Other, and uh, my aha moments were... I'll shut up. No, you're, you're fine. Uh, I, I'll mention you're articulating. As I was putting the design together, I'm like, you know what? I, I do like breaking things down into just simple things to understand. So hopefully I did a good job of taking some long-term business topics that can get very intense and breaking it down into simple information so it's not so intimidating. That was my goal for this presentation is like, I got to make sure that this doesn't come across as intimidating because I really think anybody can do it. It's just, uh, and then once you start doing it, you start like, uh, you start liking the process a, a lot. So the other aha moment is just going back and retrospectively, like, what would I have done back then if I knew everything that I knew now? And as I was trying to come up with examples, I'm like, man, I, 
I kind of was doing it, but I didn't know about it, but it kind of worked out that way. And so that was kind of cool to just think back and go through hindsight, you know, like, wow, that ended up working out and that's what we should have been doing. And that's great. And then obviously there's a lot of failures that you go through and you're like, oh, that didn't work out, but, but everything is an experience learned. So. But in actual fact, the things that don't work out, that is the whole point of testing. I'm a, I'm a huge um, uh, fangirl of Gary V, who just says, just do stuff. The more you fail, the more you work out what's working, what, what isn't, rather than just being in your head, which, it, which goes right along the lines of what you were talking about in terms of the test, you know, have tests, but make sure that they're measurable and that you've got a criteria and everything like that. The thing that you were talking about, Airbnb, um, that that was interesting as well because I'm an Airbnb host and they now, with the photography, they now offer free photographers for your listing. So they've gone that mm-hmm. next level. That's how important they consider it in a market. In that, specific, no that, specific, that specific example was actually a part of their growth hacking team coming up with that. Wow. I wonder how they do that. Maybe they offer budding photographers, you know, there must be some value exchange there or they pay for it. I don't know. It'd be interesting. I don't know that, but I, I, you know, maybe these are people that are hosts themselves and they get some kind of discounts or less cuts, less fees to offer their photography services. I don't know. Sure. Maybe their <laughs> listings are always come up in the featured listings before everyone else's. Uh, I don't that know. would be nice. <laughs> okay, are there any other comments or questions? No, let's have a look. You're just getting awesome presentation. Thank you. Barry, you wrote something about care plans, but I'm not sure whether you wanted to add um, anything to that. No, I just made a comment when Caesar was talking about um, $200, $500 a month and what you offer um, on a monthly basis after the website goes live. Um, we've talked in the community a lot about care plans and other places and I'm actually, we're actually exp- expanding on that to, to go to, you know, a higher level of a plan. It includes the hosting, it includes um, updates, security, but it also is in what we're adding to is a, a weekly, a monthly call with a customer um, for what 20 minute call or half hour call to catch up with them to find out, hey, what are you working on? What's coming up next? What can we help you out with? Things like that. And to, to, to help to stay top of mind with that customer. Because I know I do it myself. I have customers I haven't talked to in two years. They just send me the hosting bill. You know, they just pay the bill. Um, so looking at how you can um, build plans and things to sell when you sell the website that are long-term and gets you in front of, keeps you in front of the customer. Um, with, those, um, with those conversations that you have with your customers, the ones that you are having, are you finding that's having an impact on additional services or anything else? This this concept is actually fairly new to us, um, but with the customer, I know with the customers that I, I I make a point to stay in touch with, it does because they're they'll say, hey, we're doing this event in in two months, and you can give them ideas on what they can do to promote the event, whatever, how you can help them, whether mm-hmm. it's just giving them some ideas, value, or actually doing it for them for for extra work. Um, to continue on with that. Um, I think that's huge. Um, Cedric, I have another thought that you might be able to expand on, and I don't, I, I don't know if you can or not, but with the Business Catalyst folks, because uh, I've talked to a lot of them since the end of life, there's a lot of us that have been in the business a long time. I think I even mentioned it to you when, when we chatted separately about what else what else is getting away from the web development piece and more into the consultative consultative role, being consultants and helping with digital strategy and and um, client journeys and things like that, uh, road mapping and stuff like that. And and what's your thought about um, that and transitioning to that? 
because all of us are, a lot of us are, are solopreneurs. We do have, I have a team of virtual people, but other people don't have that or whatever. But it, it's like we want to move on to the next thing and maybe mm-hmm. not, not sit there and design and develop the rest of our lives and maybe help in a different way because I've so many people have talked about that. They're going in a different direction. Sure. I mean, how to pick the thing is probably one topic that we can have or one conversation. Uh, and the other is leveraging your experience and talents. Picking the thing, I've always, you know, I'm not a natural salesperson, even though I had to do sales for a long time. Uh, my strategy was always to just deliver and try to provide value, right? It's like, if you're going to pay me $10,000 for, we'll, we'll call it a digital project, my innate goal is to try to, how can I get, give you $20,000 worth of value on that $10,000 investment? Because if you paid me $10,000 and once we implemented that digital thing, it generated 20000 plus, I'll, I'll trade money like that with you all day long. Hey, Barry, you give me 10 bucks, I'll give you 20 bucks. Will you say yes? And then you say yes. And then how many times can we do this before it comes like they come to trust me, they come to trust the agency, they trust our values, they trust our integrity. Does every project like succeed? No, but the innate core values of giving that true value, that matters. Now, why did I say this? Is because you almost have to pick as yourself, especially if you're a solopreneur, what do you truly believe in that you can do really, really well for people that delivers that value? Because if you find that thing or a couple things, and if you can bundle a whole bunch of things that add up to being more than the individual parts, man, that's kind of like a no brainer, right? Like that's, that's the angle you should be. That's the thing you should pick. So that's the first thing as far as how to pick it. That's at least that's how I do it. Uh, the second piece of it is, a lot of people immediately think digital product. Wow, I got, I got to build an app. But that's not necessarily the case. I mean, the conversation you and I had were, let's say you're really good at something and you've kind of sharpened your pencil, right? And you know how to do the specifications and, you know, the, the blueprint for a project really, really well. Well, there's tons of other solopreneurs out there that are just like you, but they might really be good at operations. They might be good at design. They might be good at development. But you know what they suck at? They suck at the thing that you're really, really good at. So what if you created an amazing digital product, whether it's an ebook, whether it's screencast, whether it's you know a PDF document, whether if it's a how-to manual, what if it's like a combination of all of those, and you package it and you zip it into a file, and you just create a simple website, simple marketing, you find the audience and you say, hey, I've really figured this out. I need help in other areas, but guys, here you go. Take this. I'm sure people would pay for that because we're all looking for that advantage and we're all looking to back on what other people are great at. Uh, So thinking about digital product from that perspective doesn't have to be like a huge educational training education system. It doesn't have to be a really well-developed app. It could be simple things that you can help others learn based on your experience. So there could be things in between, of course, but that that's how I would start because once you get that taste of, you see the ticker, right? It's like, here's my digital product. I put it up on the marketplace. It sold zero. And now it's like, okay, hundred bucks, 500 bucks, thousand bucks, 3000 bucks, 10,000 bucks. And you're just waking up every morning and you're like, oh my God, I sold some more. <laughs> it's an awesome feeling. It's just an awesome feeling. And now you're going, you know what? I feel significant. I'm giving back to the community. I'm sharing. I'm providing value. Now you're an author in that particular thing. It's, it's pretty cool. Awesome. So it co- comes down to really digging deep and understanding what really is your thing and your expertise, or as they call it, your zone of genius. And I think a lot of people don't do it because they're scared. I mean, there, there is a sense of fear, like, am I good enough? And I think that's kind of what you're saying, guys, right? Just get out there and do it. Just try it, you know? The, the most a digital product at that level can do is, okay, let's say it completely fails and you sell zero. A, you learn how to put together a digital product. B, you did more research on the experience and stuff that you're really good at anyway. 
most likely the digital product itself is not the problem. It's probably how you sold it or the audience you sold it to or the marketing or the branding. But the experience that you're sharing is the good part. So it's just refining and making you better at how to present that information anyway. If anything, it's you can repurpose that content for SEO and marketing for yourself anyway. So there's literally no there's no downside other than time and energy. Um, so yeah, take take a rest, take, take a shot. And the upside is the learning, and you've still got the product. That's right. Well, the problem wouldn't be the product because they, if they hadn't bought it, they wouldn't know what it was. So, <laughs> well, I guess it could be the product, but yeah, it's it's all the things beforehand. So then that comes down to tweaking because you've already got the thing created. Yeah, that's exactly right. I don't think we have any more questions from what I can see here. We've had people saying, got to run. Thank you very much. Amazing. Um, Caesar, we have been very, very lucky and very blessed to have you. When we had you as a guest speaker on BC Sandpile, you earned the title Caesar the Saint, which has lasted for a long time. And um, yes. we thank you very much for the time that it's taken to put together your presentation and the generosity of your time today um, and answering all our questions. A pleasure. Thank you very much for having me and hopefully I'll be back sometime. Thank you. So for people, if, if people want copies of the presentation and the resources, you want them to pop, to email you directly. Is that what you'd like? We'll that is correct. So we pop in your email address into the chat box and we'll also put it up with the recording. Brilliant. Perfect. Yep. User at CesarKeller.com. I'll send you all the stuff and uh, we'll be good to go. Yeah. What he is selling. I don't, don't know what that's about. Okay. Thank you very I'm much. Not selling anything. <laughs> <laughs> This is just contributing to the community. Oh, it's a joke. Okay, yes, you can't can't tell jokes sometimes on. <laughs> Where's your smiley? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, your smiley was there. Very good. <laughs> no, absolutely. If you guys reach out to me, I'm not going to sell you guys anything. I just want to give you the resources. Thank you so much, Caesar. Thanks, man. All right, guys. Thank you for being on the show. All righty. Have a great one. Thank you very much. You guys all take care. No worries. See you later. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this month, we also have a mid-month mid presentation, which I'll be, um, or we will be letting people know about. And it's to do with um, a platform that some people have expressed an interest in called Webforce 5. So we'll let you know about that. Um, and it's in two weeks time. More details to follow. Thank you for joining us. Any final words, Barry? Nope, I think you took care of all that. We'll see everybody next time. Okie doke. See you next time.